So, so our next speaker is Keith Motes, and he's going to talk about many optical quantum metrology with single photons. Keith. All right, thank you. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about an application for boson sampling in quantum metrology. And I should say that it's a slight variation of the boson sampling protocol where we use the, the sort of physics of it instead of the computational complexity. So we use uh, the spontaneously generated entanglement to estimate an unknown phase. So when I tell people about this, many people ask, how did we come up with this protocol? And the best way I've been able to tell them is through a story. So I will tell a slight story in this talk, and I have a few people to help me. I have Matt Broom as Peter Rudy, I have Raj as Johnny Olson, and Jonathan Dowling as Jonathan Dowling. <laughs> so as, as John mentioned earlier, we have, uh, you may have noticed the, this works. Let me make sure that's on. Ned, you have to turn it on. Okay. So the, the last names of this paper spell out Mordor. So not to troll anyone, but uh, this will be known as the Mordor paper. The first person to cite it is Mordor, I will buy a bottle of champagne or bourbon or anything. Um, anything? Anything? <laughs> well, but then there's a bit. So, anything that you can afford. Yes. <laughs> so probably not champagne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it begins in Australia with Peter and I, my uh, one of my academic supervisors, and we spent my the last few years developing things in boson sampling, like like sampling other quantum states of light, um, switching into a time bin architecture. Uh, we we analyze using SPDC sources, uh, and we even um, looked at it, what it could say about the extended church Turing thesis. And so, I'm like, one day I'm like, Peter, we've been doing BS for two years now, and Yes, yes, it's time to go um, to go for the beam split. Oh, boson something, holy grail. The BS. The BS. The BS application. <laughs> yes, for this we must visit the Dark Lord Sauron. Sauron, yes. Oh, now I so, onward to Louisiana State University, where we go visit Sauron. Um, at Louisiana State University, it's a beautiful place with majestic oak trees and uh, live tigers on campus. Uh, and the ninth biggest football, or the ninth biggest stadium in the world. And this is our laboratory. <laughs> it's, a, it's a theorist's laboratory. So it's just an office. And uh, nice. if you look very closely at this picture, you might notice something a bit odd. Does anyone see it? The guy? Joel. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Yeah, this guy. So, <laughs> If you look very closely, he resembles Sauron. <laughs> so, look really close. So this is Sauron in this talk, and so we get to his office, and we arrive. We're like, we made it. It's time to come up with an application for boson sampling. There must be an application for boson sampling and quantum astrology. Said Sauron. <laughs> Oh, okay. I have even written grants to the government, it's claiming so. <laughs> so, so me and Peter are like, okay, let's go brainstorm, we have to come up with something, so be right back. So, in the meantime, while they're off brainstorming, I'm going to review. Uh, so, in metrology, it's been known for quite a while now that um, Newton states are optimal and they actually reach the Heisenberg limit. So we have a superposition of uh, n photons in each mode, they interrogate some unknown phase, and the sensitivity of this goes as 1 on n, which is the Heisenberg limit. And it's 
uh, in here is the it's it's so it's the number of photons, but for the purpose of our counting, it's better thought of as the number of resources that the experimentalist has access to. So I'll get to that a little bit later when I discuss our resource counting. So uh, we've heard a lot about boson sampling. I'll give my little review on it. So it goes like this: you you put photons in the first n modes of the of an of an interferometer and vacuum in the rest. They evolve via this the this map, so the photon creation operators get mapped to the output modes. Uh, and then out comes a, a entangled superposition over every possible configuration where S is the is a photon number configuration that you measure at the output. And the probability of getting a particular configuration is just the, the square of that amplitude. And what's interesting is the number of the number of configurations is super exponential, um, and that the the amplitude is proportional to the matrix permanence. So it's in this class, uh, sharp and hard. So this is what makes boson sampling interesting: is that it simulates a uh, it can simulate a system that no classical computer in the world can actually calculate when you make it in large enough. So that number is somewhere around 30, maybe 40. And so for the purpose of this talk, the signal that comes out is given by the permanent of the unitary matrix. And so, OK, so back to the story. So we're all brainstorming. Uh, and when you're in Louisiana, there's really only one way to go brainstorming. Uh, so this is me and Peter. Uh, one day in my backyard, just brainstorming, and and yeah, so eventually. Oi, mate! I got it. Hey, Peter comes up with a brilliant idea, and I'm like, okay, let's go to the laboratory. It's a good thing you didn't confuse the gun with the bottle of whiskey. Yeah. That would have been bad. <laughs> so, um, so Peter, he, we get to the laboratory, and Jonathan Olson has joined us now, and. and we, he writes something like this on the board. What if we have two unitaries and, and they, they give us, one's the dagger of the other, they give us identity, and, and maybe we could do something with this. And then John suggests, oh, what if we put a, a gradient of unknown phases in the middle? And so he comes up with something like this, where we put phi in, in between in every mode. Well, of course, this is no good. No, no, this is just the global phase and can't kind of factor that out. So, so what about a gradient, John says, and, and Peter comes back and so now we have a linear gradient, 1 phi, 2 phi, all the way to n phi. Peter points out, John, there is still a global phase, let's try this. And, uh, and so we factor out one of those phases and this is what we came up with. So we have a linear gradient, starts at 0 phi, goes all the way to n minus 1 phi. And then, uh, so I'm like, okay, well, what, what should V be? So we need to come up with a V. And Johnny's, Johnny's was like, what about a tensor product of Hadamard? Where's your Dimension goes as 2 to the n. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So the, the dimension goes as 2 to the n. So this is bad because we have to calculate the matrix permanent of whatever unitary we come up with. And if we can only have if we can only have, say, n is equal to 1, we have a 2 mode, 2, we have 4 mode, and then 8 mode, 16 modes, we can only really get uh, a couple of data points because very quickly calculating the matrix permanent becomes difficult. So, so uh, Peter points out, what about the QFT? So it's, a, it's dimension. Dimension goes as n. Yeah, so we can get we can have two modes, three modes, four modes, whatever, and it it mixes the it generates a lot of entanglement. So this is what we go with. Like, this is how we came up with the QFT, and and so John all, all, all of a sudden morphs back into Sauron. Get to work, orcs. And we're like, Peter, can you be Sauron? So Peter becomes Sauron, and I'm like. We can be Uruk. So here we are, the 
the team in Mordor were off to work, and this is what we came up with. So this is a you protocol. You can explain an auric high as an orc human hybrid. Yes. It's like a leader of orcs. We didn't want it to just be orcs. So. Okay. Um, so this is what we came up with. You put a single photon at the... You put a single photon at the input of every mode, and you send it through a QFT, and then you have a gradient of unknown phases that the large amount of spontaneously generated entanglement interrogates. Uh, and then we have this, we added this extra gradient of tunable phases so that in, in the lab you can tune it to the ideal regime for measuring. So, uh, and then you have the inverse of the QFT, which can be thought of as maybe undoing all these spontaneously generated entanglement. And for the, the purpose of this talk, we'll just assume we're already in the optimal measurement regime and the theta goes to zero. So we just have, to simplify it, we just have these three pieces and, and then we measure P at the output, which is our signal. And if you remember, this is the matrix, this is given by the matrix permanent of the entire interferometer U, which is the combination of all this stuff. Uh, why, so, do you, why do you need to supply on, uh, on theta in the first place? So phi is the unknown phase we're trying to estimate. Yeah. And theta is, is something we can tune in the lab so that we can tune the, the device to be an optimal me measurement. Now, uh, so in most, a lot of these schemes like in noon states, there's a sweet phase spot. So you always have a control phase and a feedback loop, and you move it to the point where the sensitivity is optimal. That's the idea. Thanks. So, you, so if the unknown phase is zero, you get QFT, QFT dagger gives you identity, so you measure one photon at every output mode. And if it's slightly away from zero, you, most of the time you'll get all ones of the output, but every now and then you'll get something else. And this is the signal we can use to estimate phi. Uh, so the entire unitary is given by the, the product of all these. And, and so taking, the, as, taking matrix multiplication, we come, up with, uh, we come up with u to be this. And so this is what we have to calculate the permanent of. And because we chose the QFT, it's a relatively simple form, although we can't, get, we can't solve it analytically. But what we can do is we can plug it into Mathematica and it spits out for up to about n equals 10, it spits out an answer. And, and so, we were like, so we were wondering, can we come up with an analytic expression for this? And and so we all we go to the lab. We're like, ah, how do you do this? Um, so we looked at it as a funny expression, but eventually Johnny found uh, an analytic. I've got it. Yes. Okay. Um, I think you should use the microphone. Uh, and this is what we came up with. So an expression, something like this, and we vary. Uh, and this is a plot of that signal up to n equals about 20, uh, and for phi is a 0 to 0.1. And you see as, as n increases, the, the slope of this gets steeper, which implies you get a better phase sensitivity. And of course, this, since this is the Mordor paper, this can be thought of, this plot can be thought of Mount Doom, which at the uh, and Gollum falls into and perishes with the ring. Sorry for the spoiler, if anyone's... Uh, Do you optimize theta for each of those points? Um, no, we haven't. But that can be done as... Uh, I'm getting to Delta Phi in a second. Okay. So, uh, this is numerically, we calculated up to n equals 25. The, the dots are the, the numerics, and the, the lines are the analytic expressions, and you can see it, it agrees up to at least n equals 25, which is 
uh, much bigger than anyone is going to do anytime soon. So, so experimentally, how can we think of obtaining the signal P? And uh, it's pretty simple. So you run the device many times. You, let's say x is the number of events you count all at once, and y is the number of events you did not get all at once. So then your signal is just is just x divided by the total number of experimental runs. Now it's it's important though that you, I believe it's important that you post select on all in photons. So you need to know. Uh, so you do have information about all the <coughs> configurations you measure, but for the purpose of this, you can throw away that information and just keep track of these two things. Uh, let's see. So, phase sensitivity. So this is the standard phase sensitivity formula. Um, the R observable is, is just the signal P at the output, uh, which again is given by the permanent of the unitary. And plotting this, uh, we see that we have the shot noise limit in black there at the top. We have our QFD method, which is the quantum Fourier transform interferometer, in red. And then we have the Heisenberg limit in orange. So uh, we have a method that's only slightly worse than the Heisenberg limit, but it only uses single photons. Uh, whereas previously, when you use noon states, uh, you have to, it's very hard to generate a noon state. So people have told me it's just as hard to generate highly entangled noon states, or high noon states. It's just as hard to do that as it is to make a universal quantum computer. So it doesn't seem like that method for metrology is going to happen anytime soon. Now, um, so if we go back, You've probably, you probably noticed these funny expressions for um, our version of the shot noise limit and the Heisenberg limit. And that's because, as I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, you have uh, the Heisenberg limit was one on n, the number of photons in the noon, in the noon state. But really, it, it can be thought of as the number of resources you use. So in our scheme, since we have a gradient of unknown phases, you interrogate these uh, many times, and so the, to count resources, it's slightly different. So I'll explain that now. So let's uh, imagine we have a, a bank of Mach Zender interferometers <coughs> that, that have the same gradient as in our QFT protocol, or the Mordor protocol. And uh, what we notice is that the the a photon interrogating a phase in, like, say, two times is the same as two photons interrogating a phase once. So, what we can do is we can change we can change the gradient over to the input. So, uh, so we say it's the same thing as this many photons interrogating a phase of, say, n minus one. Uh, let me re-say that. So, n minus one photons interrogating a phase n minus one times is the same as as one photon interrogating a phase of n minus one phi. Okay. So then, we can we can add all those interrogations up, and then we note that in the first mode it interrogates zero phi. So we add that resource of the one photon, and we come up with our number of resources which we care about, to be 1 plus this stuff. So, this is what n is in our protocol. And, and that is what we call ordinal resource counting, or ORC, for the mortal paper. So, uh, we also analyzed dephasing. The, we, we submitted it, and the, the referees were like, well, what about dephasing? So, we went ahead and analyzed this. And what we say is in each mode or each channel, there's some uh, noise in the phase, which we call uh, which we call delta k. And uh, Taylor expanded, let the the mean of it be zero, and you get something like this. 
and showing a plot of this for 10% dephasing, uh, we see that we still beat the shot noise on it. So this is from 0 dephasing to 0 0.01 dephasing. And so that's interesting. We, we still beat the shot noise limit. That's really good. Now, what's even more interesting is when we, we use the same amount of dephasing but in the noon state, uh, we see that, that in the beginning the noon state still beats the, the QFT. But at about n equals 25 or maybe 35 or so, the noon state blows up and we get, and we do better than the noon state, which is very interesting. So, so you might ask, what could we measure? Now, uh, really we, we did it in a general way and you can, you can set it up to where you can measure many different things. So one, one example might be magnetic fields. So you set up, um, you set up some array where you, you have a magnetic field interrogating the, the device, and you, you set up these cells such that there's a linear gradient. Uh, so maybe you detect magnetic fields, maybe you detect gravity waves, maybe you image photons or atoms or whatever. And so I wanted to say that um, as a final remark, uh, this protocol is is very simply made. So we have uh, what we did. We chose it so that we could solve for the permanent fairly easily. So you might imagine something other than a, a, a linear phase gradient. Maybe a nonlinear, maybe quadratic. You can set it up in different ways. Um, maybe instead of the quantum Fourier transform, you choose a different v. Um, perhaps we, we can improve it further by optimizing some of these things. Um, maybe you have a different input state, you select on different configurations. Uh, perhaps you can do more quantum technology such as lithography or imaging. Um, and in conclusion, metrology with single photons beats the shot noise limit and it's a world's first application for boson sampling using the physics of it instead of really the computational complexity. Um, this has appeared in PRL, and more recently I've updated the archive version so that it, it has everything the PRL version does, but it also has cross-links from the, the uh, paper to the appendices, which has lots of important information in it. Yeah, other than that, thank you. Yeah. Oh, lots of questions. Protecting. Keith, I, I think I've now finally crystal, crystallized why this work troubles me a little bit. And you said uh, during the talk that it's very hard to make a noon state. Mm. Uh, in fact, it's it's not. You you take a set of single photons, you send it through a linear optical network that looks very much like the one you've shown, and you get a noon state. But not very often. It's uh, 2n factorial divided by n to the n. Okay, is the probability that that works. And so there was some paper by Kevin Resch a few years ago that showed that given that, as soon as you went to four photons or above, you were just better off taking those four single photons and putting it through a classical interferometer, and you got a better result in terms of resources than making the noon state through the linear network. I feel that the same thing should apply here, mm. because the states that you're wanting to make are extremely unlikely. Um, where so all, all photons at the input. That, well, no, all the photons at the input, and then you get this particular, so for your P plus and your P minus, uh, those things are going to have some n factorial and n to the n kind of drop off as well. No? So why is that not true? So he's asking why is the 111 output the most likely output? Ah, because uh, the unknown phase is really close to zero. So most of the time you get all ones at the output. Because it's uh, so the unknown phase has to be close to zero. That's, that's the purpose yes. of the control phase. We move to the sweet spot. Yeah. But that's standard with almost all particles. Okay. There's okay. a control phase and a feedback. Uh, so I have two questions. The first is, what's the um, 
computational complexity of calculating that control phase so you can get the optimum? <coughs> um, so what you can do is, so you want to, so for a, a given number of input photons, you want to optimi optimize what the, the uh, optimal mm -hmm. measurement regime is, right? Mm -hmm. So you can take our expression for delta phi, uh, take the derivative with respect to n, set it to zero, solve for the, the phi that would be optimal for a particular n. Okay, so, so it's not hard to do? Uh, no. no. Yeah, so um, it's, it reminds me phase estimation a little bit, in the sense that uh, you want to entangle uh, so you want to prepare, you know, like the, the phase estimation works like this, right? So you have like entangled state between, you know, your control uh, qubit and the first uh, implementation of your phase, uh, uni the unitary for t equals zero, and then you have another step, uh, so horizontal. Right here, it looks like in, in vertical. So your phase zero component is on the top. Uh, that you have a second level, which is phase, you know, that you have two phase, three phase. So it's like a, it looks like a the phase estimation in vertical rather than horizontal. Like a parallelized phase estimation. Mm -hmm. To me, it sounds like a parallelized version of phase estimation. Did you think about it? Uh, well, we make a gradient of along the modes. So the gradient is, the slope is just the, goes as the number of modes. And that's just because, uh, you don't want, if, you, if it's just all phi, factor out as a global phase, uh, and then you couldn't estimate it. So you do you do like a zero, then you do one phase, two phase, three yes. phase. In phase estimation we do, I don't know if we do zero, but we do like two, four, so we, do, we double every time, right? So uh, I guess if you just double instead of the adding one, it would look much more like this, even more. So maybe that's more, it could be more efficient, I don't know. Yeah, that, that's something definitely. To yeah, there's a lot of analysis. different sort of gradients for the 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 phase shifters. Yes, yeah. question. Uh, uh, towards the end, how does that phase relate to your measurement, which is the ratio? Is that linearly proportional? Uh, so you are estimating the phase. Uh, that was yes. And then you measure this O1 and O you get that ratio. Yes. How does those two relate? Um, because imagine that if phi was zero and this was a there was no losses and, and things, you would always get one 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 at the output. So P would be one in that case. And then say you you tune the unknown phase is slightly greater than zero then most of the time you have identity and you get all ones at the output and then and but every now and then you get a few configurations that are not all ones. I see. But what's the, what's the function? So I just wonder whether that relationship is linear or some other more complex dependence. What's, what's p as a function of phi? p is a function of phi. Yes. <coughs> or phi is a function of p. I think we have p as a function. I think it's linear. In, in the small phi approximation, this, yeah. Uh, as a function of phi, and mm -hmm. so. So p, and then you extract phi. You don't have the small phi approximation on the slides, do you? Uh, we, we did that for the calculating the. <laughs> the uh, let's see, where is it? Somewhere there, no. The delta phi. This, um, this is the this is for the small angle approximation. So when phi is close to zero. Yeah. Like I, I didn't scan. mention that. I should have. I, I think linear is correct. Thanks, <coughs> uh, We have a little bit of time. Actually, I, I had a question. Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, so the one thing I'm struggling with is some sort of physical mechanism, like a magnetic field, changes the phase to n delta phi, right? 
Okay. So are we actually estimating the minimum value of n times delta phi or the minimum value of delta phi? Um, so, so, so remember how we, we, we gave an example using EIT and then yeah, I yeah. Tell, explain that. So imagine you have a, a, a cell, some sort of cell where um, say some length of it uh, with a photon transverse and it causes a phase shift phi if a magnetic field is penetrating it. So then you could just imagine that as our, for our phase shifters we have in the first mode we don't have a cell. In the second mode, we have a cell of length one. Uh, in the second one, we have a cell of length two, and all t all the way to n minus one. And then you can imagine a uniform magnetic field penetrating this. So th this is just one example of of something you might measure, but it, it's pretty generalized in that you, it, as an engineer or experimentalist, you can you can modify that to measure many different things. So so the answer is. We're measuring delta phi, which in that example would be delta b, the uncertainty in the magnetic. But why wouldn't I take the last cell, which has a phase change of n times delta phi, and stick that into a two-mode interferometer? Um, because then you'd have to use noon states, which are difficult to generate for high noon states. Because so delta phi is really small, right? Right. right. So we are in the camp that just making the cell longer in a two-mode interferometer doesn't give you any improvement in signal to noise. And if you apply our resource counting to schemes that do that, they do no better than shot noise. Okay, right. So I should just to emphasize the, uh, the, the point of this is that we can do metrology yeah, only yeah. preparing single photons. Barry Sanders input, agrees with me. Uh, send them through passive linear optics and, and do photon counting at the output and uh, estimate that phase. So without using fast feed forward and things like this, it's just passive linear up. We're, we're trying to be okay. friendly. Another one. We're trying to advertise that everybody else does. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not asking about research. I would just follow that. I just forgot so you were saying, I understood that for very little phase, is basically the you can maximize the probability in which only single photons comes out. So it's not really that you're doing sampling, only one sample really matters to you, as far as I understood. Yeah. Is it, is, but is this, uh, uh, I was just wondering, uh, if you increase, you know, you have this gradient, so you, that, that, that depends on that. Increasing n, I, I, I would expect that also the number of events that are not just single photon that action there, you can have like one channel that attacks two photons and, and, and the other, and one of them zero and the other of one. All, all of these events, I mean, it's not so clear to me that really, uh, I mean, did you really work it out uh, that, that uh, you know, the, how the probability of events that you don't like, how does it scale with the, with the end that it, you have it's not that we don't like the events, we actually do like them because uh, we have to divide by the uh, by the total number of runs so that the numerator in, in P was the number of runs that we got all one. So sometimes we get other configurations which we do care about. Uh, but I think what you're saying is that as the, the size of the device gets bigger, uh, the probability of not getting all ones at the output increases, right? Yeah, actually helps so you. That corresponds. It helps. Yeah, it helps you, right? I would say that corresponds to just uh, having a higher sensitivity of phase estimation. Um, but I agree that as your device is bigger, it's more sensitive. So it's just the one with single potency. Sure, but that's easy to do, right? Because you take your phases out, and then you've just got identity. Yeah, that's the, so that's, that's your normalization. Yeah, so that's, that's, I think, the justification that he gave. Since the phases are very little, mm -hmm. it, it's really maximized the probability of having only just single fold, and that's how I understood. So my question is, but when, since you're really measuring a gradient there, that depends on this value m, how does really the probability associated to other events that may be just one fold or more in one channel really scale, scale with increasing of the end in the gradient. That's, that was my there question. Lots of things to check. This is, 
This just appeared last week. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but no. <laughs> just that was because in, 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 that gives you like a limit in how how big you can, uh, you know, problem on sensitivity. And we haven't yeah. so, we haven't really done the photon loss reckoning yet, so that's yeah. next. Okay. So I think uh, you can you can calculate the probability of getting a perf of the configuration all ones. Yes. Uh, for a given n and, and theta, and then, sure. yeah. uh, and then the probability of getting something else would just be one minus that. Right, right. And, then, and see how much it is with respect to n. Do you know yes. what the probability is? Uh, getting a one just off the top of your head? And, uh, okay. Okay. Well, easily calculated. Yeah. Awesome, that this is definitely inspiring a lot of discussion. Um, luckily, Keith will be around. Uh, we have to break for lunch, so let's thank both our speakers again.